Good afternoon. My name is Samantha Anderson, and I'm the Senior Director for Member Services at the Jewish Funders Network. Thank you for joining Lifting the Rock, What We Need to Know and Do About Charlottesville and Hate in America. Before we begin the webinar, we will have a, a few housekeeping details to share. First, everyone has joined the webinar in listen-only mode. If you have questions during the presentation and you are joining us on the web, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box you see on the screen in front of you. Two, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website. So if you have to jump off for any reason, rest assured you'll be able to listen at a later time that works for you. The Jewish Funders Network works with Jewish funders at the individual and collective levels to improve the quality of their giving and maximize their impact as they make the change they want to see in the world. JSN leverages the power and the creativity of networks to strengthen Jewish philanthropy around the world. Our year-round programming aims to keep members up to speed on the latest and most pressing topics in philanthropy and the Jewish community. We strive to help members build their philanthropic toolkits and explore relevant and important issues. In this webinar, experts with deep knowledge about white supremacist hate groups will address the situation post Charlottesville and will bring the Jewish funder community up to speed on the state of hate in America. We will also entertain your questions after the speaker's presentations. So again, please type your questions into the box you'll see on your screen. Before I introduce our moderator, Sharon Alpert, President and CEO of the Nathan Cummings Foundation, I'd like to thank Abby Levine of the Jewish Social Justice Roundtable. Abby has been an important contributor to the design of today's program, and JFN greatly values the Roundtable's partnership in presenting this important program to you all. Now, I'd like to turn the program over to Sharon, who will introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you, Abby, and thank you for your partnership um, with us and with um, the amazing panelists that we have today on this really incredibly important topic for our community, for our grantees, and for our partners in the field. I am honored to be here with all of you and this incredible lineup of panelists, some of whom I've known for a long time and some of whom I'm just getting to know. As a family foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation is rooted in the Jewish tradition of social justice. And we believe deeply that inequality, you can't talk about inequality without talking about issues of race. From our board to our staff to our partners, we were deeply troubled by the events in Charlottesville. The images of white nationalists marching that night, holding lanterns, using anti-Semitic and racist language, chanting Jews will not replace us and blood and soil. And as shocking as these images were, they were not surprising to us, nor did they just start this year. They were familiar. Anti-Semitism like racism, misogyny, homophobia, and other forms of hate are alive and well in American political discourse. A movement of white nationalists emboldened by some in the highest positions of political leadership in this country and across the globe is only the most recent example of those who believe that choose to be the source of all the woe in the world. Thankfully, I'll hold the images of Charlottesville along with other images, images of students at the University of Virginia standing against the white nationalists in the dark of the night, and images of the local community, faith leaders, and other allies who came to stand beside them. Many of Nathan Cummings Foundation partners and grantees were present on the ground, the Anti-Defamation League, Truwa, the Reform Movement, Auburn Seminary Senior Fellows, and many others, and we've been energized by them. And for better or for worse, the actions of these white nationalists brought the link between anti-Semitism and racism back to the center of our national discourse. And that's what we're here to talk about today. As Jewish people, as funders, as people of color, as advocates for social justice, we can do more to support them. As Jews, we can do more. We can do more to stop the momentum of the white supremacist movement and to help others see that racism, anti-Semitism, and white supremacy are intersecting ideologies with important implications for our safety, for our future, for our communities, for our children, and for the kinds of partnerships we need to push back on this noxious hate. Today we'll explore some of the lessons of Charlottesville and many stories and lessons that have come before to discuss the intersections between racism and anti-Semitism, 
how this intersection functions in white supremacy. We'll also highlight some of the policies being implemented to craft some of these remedies, programs, responses on the ground, and explore what we as funders can do in the community to combat hate in America. So now I'd like to introduce our panel. Eric Ward is the incoming executive director of the Western State Center, a senior fellow at the Southern Poverty Law Center, and author of Skin in the Game, How Anti-Semitism Animates White Nationalism. I came to know Eric when he was a program officer at the Ford Foundation. He's been a longtime civil rights strategist and considered a national expert on the relationship between hate violence, preserving democratic institutions, governance, and inclusive societies. Yavila McCoy is the CEO of diversity consulting group Dimensions, Inc. For over 20 years, Yavila has worked with a broad base of leaders and organizations to provide transformational resources for diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies. Yavila is a pioneer of the Jewish diversity and equity movement and has been an activist and mentor for the empowerment of Jews of color for most of her life. I came to know Yavila when she facilitated a session at Auburn last year and have been so blown away by the work that she's been doing with our communities. Michael Lieberman is, a Was is Washington Council and Director of the Civil Rights Policy Planning Center at the Anti-Defamation League. Michael is ADL's point person on the federal response to bias motivated crimes and chairs the broad coalition of groups in Washington promoting improved federal response to hate violence. He promotes the league's involvement in Washington on a wide variety of domestic policy, equality, criminal justice, and civil rights issues, including religious freedom and the importance of church and state separation. Michael also directs ADL's Civil Rights Policy Planning Center, and NCF made a responsive grant to the ADL last December in response to the changing political discourse and rise of anti-Semitism and hate in our country. Thank you to all three of you for being here today. This is such an important and timely conversation. We appreciate your responsiveness, and we have about 90 plus uh, attendees who I'm sure will be eager to learn from you and to ask you questions as well. So we will begin by turning this over to Eric. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, and, and thanks for inviting me. I, I want to just spend uh, a few moments today walking through uh, Charlottesville and but first by taking a step back um, to look at uh, the white nationalist movement uh, in America and, um, and what it means uh, for those of us who are trying to continue to strengthen a democracy, one that is people-centered, um, inclusive, and, and transparent. We'll go to the, to the next slide. Um, I lived in the state of Oregon uh, for many years. I moved up there when I was 20 uh, with friends from, from high school too who were going to the University of Oregon. Um, myself, I was just trying to, to, to get out of LA. It was, uh, it was a crazy time uh, for a young man and I was looking uh, for a better life. And you know, Oregon has a very interesting history. Oregon is, um, had the largest Klan membership uh, west of the uh, Mississippi uh, in the 1920s. Uh, it was a, a place in, in, in many respects where the modern white nationalist movement uh, cut its teeth. Um, it is a, a, a place that uh, has uh, a small population of, of people of color, less than 10%, uh, less than Six percent when when I lived there, and and so Oregon has always been a, a very peculiar geographic uh, location with its challenges, but but also with its opportunities. There has been a long time resistance um, against bigotry. I didn't know most of that when I was a young twenty one year old, just trying to 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 restart his life. Um, I had other questions about Oregon. I I wanted to know. Uh, whether they had a McDonald's there when I was moving up and I wanted to know if there was electricity because in my head I, I had never really been out of California um, and certainly not Southern California my entire life and 
So I had these images of uh, Oregon looking somewhat like Little House in the Prairie, literally, right? Uh, dirt roads and uh, no electricity and, and log cabins. And so these were the questions that I asked my friends and they assured me that in fact there was electricity and, and running water. Um, and when I moved to Oregon, ultimately I found out that that was true. And that what I had was just a lot of stereotypes in my head about what Oregon looked like and what life in Oregon would be. And it was once I began to experience Oregon um, that I began to, to dispel uh, with those stereotypes. So I summed that moment up in my life by saying, if you could have peeled off my head um, and looked at my brain before I moved to Oregon, what you would have seen visually in my head was San Francisco, a bunch of trees, and the Space Needle, which wasn't even in Oregon. But ultimately what I realized was that Oregon was much more complex and nuanced, and that um, the only way I could understand those complexities and nuances was by dispelling with some of my own stereotypes. As we begin to talk about white nationalism this morning, um, I want you all to pick up some of the same challenge. In many ways, it is our failure to understand this rising movement because we continue to cling uh, to some of our own stereotypes about what we are experiencing and seeing in this moment. We can go to the next slide, slide three, what is white nationalism? White nationalism is a social movement. And I say that to distinguish it from white supremacy. White supremacy being a system um, of disparities that was created to exploit uh, people of color, primarily indigenous uh, communities and um, people held in captivity of African descent. White supremacy is made up of culture and, and systems of disparity that continue to play out in present day America. It is in the 1960s that we see one of the largest mobilizations uh, to challenge white supremacy. And, and at that point, white supremacy uh, was de jour, meaning it was the rule of law in the United States. It was used to upheld things such as segregation um, and other forms of racial discrimination. It is the civil rights movement in the 1960s through a series of campaigns and direct actions that eventually um, leads to the dismantling um, of white supremacy as de jour, meaning under the rule of law. It certainly still exists as de facto and certainly plays out in very real ways. But what the civil rights movement accomplished in the 1960s was something very significant in the sense that it was a defeat of white supremacy. What happens in that moment is that those who had defended segregation are stunned. In their worldview, African Americans are inferior. So how do they explain this loss to people who are inferior, this significant loss of power? And it is in this moment that they then develop a worldview that goes on and creates a direct line between the events of 1963 to today. We first see the white nationalist movement appear in mass in 1979 in Greensboro, North Carolina. It is part of a large demonstration that is marked as a Klan demonstration that is being opposed by anti-Klan demonstrators. But what happens here is that for the first time, neo-Nazis, which are mostly an urban phenomenon in 1979, and Klansmen joined forces. Previous to this period, most Klansmen rejected neo-Nazism. They did not see, they saw it as something other. In fact, they or many of their parents had fought against the Nazis in World War II. They saw it as something that was un-American and strange and urban. 
But in 1979, we see the first joining together <clears throat> of Klan and neo-Nazis who join and come to this march and then open fire, killing anti-Klan demonstrators in front of law enforcement. The movement continues to grow. And in spring of 2017, a white nationalist who has been trying to antagonize individuals on the public transportation system in Portland is actually confronted by three white males who try to defend two young African-American women being targeted by this nationalist, this white nationalist. The white nationalist ends up pulling up a knife, stabbing three, these three individuals and killing two of them. It is the events in the spring of 2017 that take place on the streets of Portland, Oregon, that lead to the direct line to Charlottesville. Again, I want to reiterate one more time that we have to distinguish between white supremacy as a system of disparities based off of race and other forms of bigotry and white nationalism as a emerging social movement. In fact, white supremacy and white nationalism have as much in common with one another as Christianity and Judaism. Certainly it is true that Christianity has its initial worldview and mythology within Judaism, but no one would compare the two belief systems as being one and same of the parcel. They are very separate. And in the same way, white supremacy and white nationalism are also different. They call each for a set of tools and narratives and organizing to respond to both. We do not defeat one without the other, nor are they in competition with one another. If white supremacy is about the subjugation of people of color, what we have to understand is that white nationalism is about the removal of all people of color and the creation of a white ethno state free of people of color. Next slide. So what is the goal? How does the white nationalist movement seek to create this ethno state? It seeks to create this ethno state by seizing state power. One of the stereotypes that we hold about the white nationalist movement is that it simply seeks to spread hate. Um, and we just need to understand and counter the hatred of this movement. What I want to argue with you is that white nationalism's goal is not to spread hate. Its goal is to seize state power, and it is willing to use racism, homophobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia to build power in order to seize the state. The tactics that it is willing to, sh to engage in are fear and intimidation. That includes the rise of, of hate crimes, the disruption of social justice spaces, um, intimidation and death threats against the leaders, to paralyze individuals into silence. The second is attacking the belief that a multiracial society is possible. The best defense against white nationalism is the vision that a multiracial society can work, that a multiracial democracy can exist. And so we see attempt after attempt of white nationalists to undercut this idea that people can live across lines of race and ethnicity in America. The third is the undermining of democratic institutions. Um, this is the building of parallel institutions such as paramilitary forces, um, but also can include the situation that is occurring in Texas right now where a group of white nationalists have actually forced FEMA out of one of the recovery areas um, from, um, that's recovering from Hurricane um, Irma. This may not have been um, publicized much in the media, but white nationalists went specifically into a, com into a community that is primarily Cambodian um, and through intimidation have forced FEMA out and are attempting to supply um, many of the services that FEMA and other 
um, disaster recovery um, organizations often pro um, provide. The goal there is to undermine democratic institutions and to try to create a buffer against some of the charges of racism and anti-Semitism. But if fear and intimidation and attacking the belief that a multiracial society and undermining democratic institutions are tactics, what I want to explain is that anti-Semitism is the paper upon which those tactics are built. And we can go to slide number five. Whereas white supremacy as a system was built on the idea of anti-blackness um, and justifying the theft of resources and the genocide of native people, white nationalism is created on the belief that the reason that white supremacy lost was because of a secret Jewish cabal. We don't have to um, um, guess around this. We can read it in most white nationalist writings, whether we're talking about the protocols, the, the, the reemergence and recirculation of the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, a Russian forgery created in uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s, to the pages of the Turner Diary, which has, was a blueprint for Timothy McVeigh and other white nationalist terrorists, um, or the recent chants in Charlottesville that Jews will not replace us. Anti-Semitism provides the, the, the worldview, right, understanding for white nationalists, an ultimate battle between good and evil. And everything is blamed on this idea of a Jewish cabal. So at the core of almost all white nationalist thinking is the belief that the ultimate fight is between Jews, right, and the white race. White nationalists do not consider Jews white and do not see them as part of their future white ethno state. And whether we are talking about Black Lives Matter, whether we're talking about Muslim Americans, immigrants, gay marriage, for the most part, all of these are laid at the hands of a secret Jewish cabal. Anti-Semitism is the gas that fuels um, white nationalism. And to successfully push back against white nationalism, we will need to address both anti-Semitism as well as systems of white supremacy. So what can we do? Next slide. Six. One thing that I tell organizations and funders is that the first strategy is to break paralysis. We have to find ways to get in ordinary individuals, not just the most famous, not just our organizations, but to find paths for ordinary people to break their paralysis and to feel enough courage to be able to speak up to their neighbors and friends. I point to the example in the 90s in, in Montana uh, where uh, a, a brick had been thrown through the window of a Jewish family uh, because a menorah had been put in the window. And the community of Billings, Montana, ultimately responded by everyone putting menorahs in their windows. While certainly not of the scale of, of the March on Washington um, or the March across Selma Bridge, these small steps are critically important in helping people break their paralysis and to feel that they can make a difference as an individual. It is the key step in building and strengthening communities to take further action. Next slide. Find creative responses. We cannot simply rely on the tactic of, of, of simple counter demonstrations. Political theater, in many cases, um, it has become that have allowed others to just see both sides as, as the flip side of the same coin. That is untrue and very unhelpful. Lemons to lemonade campaigns, I think, are really essential. The photo that you're looking at right now is of a Nazi march in, in um, Germany, and it takes place every year to honor um, 
a leader of the original Nazi party. The community for years led very many counter protests. But last year, they decided to do something different. And they marked out with paint in different spaces along the street and got the community and others to pledge dollars for every mark in the street that the neo-Nazis passed. And they would collect this money and donate it to an organization that actually helps to pull extremists out of the neo-Nazi movement. And so the community put up celebratory flags, they put out snacks to encourage the neo-Nazis to continue the march, not to give up, because for every step the neo-Nazis marched, they would raise additional dollars for anti-hate work. They basically flipped the switch on the march, taking away some of the intimidation factor and putting the burden back on neo-Nazis to have to deal with the fact that in actuality, they are outnumbered, that they are the minority. Next slide. We have to build an inclusive democracy that is people-centered, transparent, and accountable. Hate groups, white nationalists, don't come to our communities bringing racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia with them. They simply organize the bigotry that already exists. Their best weapon is pointing out the contradictions that exist in our society. Each contradiction around racism, around homophobia, around anti-Semitism only reinforces their idea that a multiracial society can't work. So ultimately defeat white nationalism, to move ourselves beyond just managing it, right, to defeating it means both creating a set of tactics to take on white nationalism, but not at the cost of our ongoing work to dismantle white supremacist systems of disparity in American society. That is the work before us. I'll close with a quick note. Charlottesville marked a new moment um, for America in terms of white nationalism. In the wake of Charlottesville and, and the death and injuries that have occurred there, the white nationalist movement is trying to take stock and in some ways is somewhat split about how to proceed. Some were put off by the violence, some are embracing the violence, but it is a moment where they are trying to reconsolidate their movement and prepare to take next steps. It is not merely just on the streets, but in the halls of power that white nationalists are beginning to flex their influence. It is in this moment of their discombobulation that we must step into. It is probably the best opportunity to really confront this movement and to push back on its attempts to build power. Thanks everyone for joining me today. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. I'm sure there are a lot of questions and that was such a thoughtful and insightful analysis, rich in story um, that I'm sure we could all um, connect with. I really appreciate that. Um, and we're going to turn it over next to Yavila and then to Michael and then we're going to have questions from all the participants. Well, not all of you, but from a few participants um, uh, joining us today. So, um, Yavila, I'd love to turn it over to you now. Um, as someone who really represents uh, uh, proving that multiculturalism in the Jewish community um, is what makes us so, in, what is powerful and impactful and integral to our own um, um, capacity to endure <laughs> um, and is critical, um, I'd love to, to turn it over to you now. Some sadness is that two days before I arrived, there was an African-American student who was beat to unconsciousness in College Town by a white um, fraternity group. And a couple days before that, or a week before that, all these things happening since the start of school, a young um, Muslim woman's burqa was stolen from her dorm room and hidden by her fellow students. Yavila, 
Would you mind speaking up for everybody? I'm not sure everyone even heard from the beginning. Oh, shall I start again? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, actually. Thank you so much. We want to make sure we can hear you. All right, I'll start again. Good morning. It's Yavila. How are you? Um, I come to you from Cornell University, is what I was saying, where I've been working with students all week on building multicultural partnerships and finding means of solidarity in hard times. Uh, I was explaining that there was an African American student who was just this past week beaten to unconsciousness by a white fraternity on campus in College Town. And I've heard also that there was a Muslim student whose burqa was stolen out of her dorm room and hidden by her fellow students. Um, this all in the context of students in Hillel trying to find ways to relate to Charlottesville, which happened also just around the start of school and feeling kind of isolated around faculty and others not naming anti-Semitism in the context of the discussions that are coming up in Charlottesville. So what I'm saying to you is the issues of white supremacy and white nationalism ha are having impact on a daily, um, on a daily basis where students are trying to find leadership and voice and ways of being on campuses where these issues are being discussed, but not always in ways where they can feel connection and proximity. So to start there, what I wanna say to you is that Dimensions is all about helping us to look at societal issues like white nationalism and white supremacy, not as the work of looking at those terrible folks out there who live in Oregon and not on the coasts and in places where we don't always necessarily feel proximate to, but to see those as issues that relate to our work, the daily work we must do every day of remaining proximate to each other and understanding the narratives of each other's suffering. On one college campus, students who live in one room away from each other often don't understand or know each other's narratives. So I extrapolate from that to wonder whether in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our corporations and organizations, we have the tools to remain proximate to each other's stories and to live those stories out as means of change. So in Dimensions Educational Consulting, we have a way of helping people to get behavioral about that work. And one is to look at the work of change on four levels. And those levels are personal, interpersonal, systemic institutional, and cultural. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you an example on each of those levels of how we can think about our means in behavioral terms of ending white supremacy and dis of dismantling white supremacy and ending the power of white nationalism by learning the ways in which we can find entry points. So on the personal level, what I would say to you is that the first thing we have to do on the personal level is agree to have feelings. Often what happens on the personal level is we see these images, we see people shouting Nazi slogans and De de declaring Jews will not replace us. And what happens first is we go scared and we go numb. Those feelings of fear and confusion and numbness come from a place in our brains that is not creative. It is probably some of the most unproductive and unresourceful range of emotions we can have unless we make a choice to be able to turn those feelings into messengers. So if we are on and you'll see my slide there. If you will see the feeling wheel, which is a tool we give to students, anytime you're, you're impacted by a situation of hatred or a situation of conflict, you're liable to feel on the red side of the feeling wheel, sad, mad, or scared. And it also might mean that you're not yet at the core of your feelings and you could be feeling confused, you could feel rejected, you could feel helpless, you could feel insignificant, all of these range of emotions can come up around a core human feeling of being scared. When we understand that feeling scared is the beginning but not the end of the story, we can turn and flip to the next slide. Flip to the next slide, please. We can turn to what is the message of feeling scared. When I am feeling scared, I can learn in company of my allies to name that there is a danger to name that there are people who need protection, support, or reassurance, and then to decide what is the action that can be taken to turn my fear 
into a message for myself, for my allies, for the people who care about community to do something to eliminate what caused the feeling itself. So for each of the feelings, the core human feelings, sadness, scared, mad, joyful, peaceful, powerful, we're teaching students and we're teaching people to have language, to be able to not just stay in a place of having the feelings with no action attached to them, but to turn your feelings into an opportunity. And when people learn to name in the context of white supremacy and white nationalism, how their feelings have a message toward action, it builds relationships and it helps people to know where they stand together from a human obligation to make change. So that's on the personal. On the second level, we're talking interpersonal. In the context of interpersonal, we want to know how do we take what we feel inside and have it preach outward? Have it make relationships that can stand against issues that we don't want to persist in our society. So I'm going to give you another example from the work that I've been doing on college campuses, which is Yale University. There was an instance where another fraternity, I love these fraternities, they've got a lot of work to do, but in, there's a fraternity on campus who on Halloween dresses in blackface. And also when African-American young women go to attend a party, essentially use epithets to tell them why they can't enter into the party, which is on campus, which should be open and equitable space for all students. After this happens, the students begin to protest the racism that they feel they are experiencing in Yale, not just in the context of the fraternity, but in general, microaggressions that are happening on campus, that are happening through faculty, that are happening through other students. And what happens very interestingly along the lines of what Eric is teaching around people forming relationships and feeling like it's our work, not those people's work. Um, the Yale Hillel decides to invite the students who are protesting in the president's office with demands to come for Shabbat. And here's the interrelational, the interpersonal piece. The reason why they invite them into Shabbat is because they say to them, we understand that you are fighting because this is proximate to you because this is something that is hurting you. But as you're fighting, we understand that you also need rest. And we celebrate rest every week here at Hillel. We celebrate the need to work hard all week and then rest through our practice of Shabbat. We would like to extend our practice of Shabbat to you and offer you a free meal and offer you that we will take notes for you and offer to support you in whatever way we can to be able to make sure that you can have the resilience to keep on in your fight. That is a beautiful story. It was, it was generated by students themselves, but it's a way to take something that you feel inside is wrong and have it preach outward into another community with integrity in the I voice saying that interpersonally we share a commitment to ending injustice. I wanna take you to the next level, which is systemic institutional. While we are talking about the fact that we have feelings on a personal level about what's happening around us and that we have to connect to each other on a human level about those things, while we are saying that on a one-to-one -one level we can form relationships that help us to hold each other and the systems accountable, we still have to be able to name the systems and make demands that create equity around us that are not just related to our feelings and our relationships, but to the ways in which we navigate institutions and organizations and laws and practices that keep inequity alive, that keep norms around white supremacy alive and are not named. So I'm gonna give you an example of systemic institutional here at Cornell, when this incident happened, the East Asian students decided to align with the BSU and to write a letter, which was very beautiful. But in that letter, they named the history of Cornell itself. They named how long these issues have been happening at Cornell. They called the administration to not just meet with students, but to also deal with issues of diversity and cultural affairs, to deal with the way in which the culture of Cornell makes it clear that whiteness and the history of whiteness that formed this university are the norm and standard, and that people who push against it are not the norm and standard, are not held equitably by the university and its policies. And they wrote that letter not as an affected community. They wrote that letter as a community that cares and that cares for our world being a place where their leadership can have impact. And they wrote it in first person.
from the East Asian Council. Now, what I encouraged the students who are Jewish on campus to do is to do the same thing in regard to how anti-Semitism and the issues of anti-Semitism connect to what's happening on their campus and how their fears and how their, their, their silence and how their way of being has been impacted by Charlottesville should now preach outward to the way in which they felt silenced by faculty not naming anti-Semitism. They should feel as equally prodded by this university not naming its connection to racism and white supremacy and lack of action in regard to recent events. How in systems can we learn to preach outward with our message when we are directly impacted and targeted by a system? Cultural. This is an important one. <laughs> Culturally, we are Jewish. Religiously, we are Jewish. The identity of Judaism forms us and shapes us in so many ways around language and ritual and practice. What I've been saying is that culturally what's important is to be able to find words and language that can also form relationships and help people to see where we stand culturally in the name of justice and ending white supremacy and white nationalism. So culturally what I do is I go into spaces that are multiracial, multiracial and multicultural and I say the Shema and I say when we say Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, we are meaning culturally that we have a God that is not the God of division and hatred, but a God of oneness and unity. And when we see anything else, we are inspired to shout out, not in our name. I say culturally that we have a connection to this idea that others' dignity must be as precious to, our, to us as our own, and that comes to us from the teaching of the sayings of the fathers. I say to them that it is not incumbent upon us to finish the work, but it is also for us not to desist from it. And culturally and religiously, this is why we come to these places to stand. I say, kol ha'olam kulo, gesher sam re'od, v'ha'ikar lo lefachit klau which is that we are taught in our religion that the world is a very narrow place, but the essence is not to fear as we approach. So what I'm going to say to you is there are ways in which we can take our culture and our tradition and our religious practices and find the ways in which they speak directly to justice. And when we do that, it forms these one-on-one -on -one relationships where people can see us multidimensionally, multiculturally as a Jewish people. And that is helping people to stand with us against anti-Semitism because they see us as part of the fabric of justice. This is one way to fight. We can fight cognitively by understanding the norms and systems and the history and political significance of where hatred comes from. But we can also fight by standing and being present in a very proximate way to our own history, to our own tradition, to the way in which that tradition speaks outward, to the way in which we are directly impacted, to the way in which we can use language and proximity, proximity to what's happening to us right now, to not go into isolation, but to let ourselves be visible in ways that preach forward. So that is where I come from in regard to this work. Um, that is some of what I'm seeing. That is some of what I'm, I'm understanding to be effective and powerful in this moment. And I would stop there. I think I have five more minutes, but <laughs> I think I'm good. Thank you, Yavila. That was incredibly powerful. Thank you for bringing the feeling into this conversation um, and reminding us of those uh, four uh, parts of the spectrum on this. And we'll, be, we'll come back to that. I'm sure there'll be many questions on that as well. So thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Michael now and then we'll come back for questions at the end. We are seeing some questions queue up right now on the Zoom. Um, keep getting your questions in and um, I will uh, bring them into the conversation and actually ask those who have put those questions forward, I'll call your name, ask you to unmute if you can and, um, and ask the question yourself so that we can feel connected in community. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone in the East. Uh, good morning, people in the West. I really appreciate the JFN invite uh, 
to participate. I'm really delighted to share the platform, Eric, with you. And Yavila, you are always a sense uh, of inspiration for me and for us. Really appreciate those powerful words. I think this, the starting point is that those of us that work in this field, identifying the nature and magnitude of problems, also have a responsibility to help craft policies, programs, ways forward to address these problems. And I wanna talk about a couple of them. As Sharon mentioned when she introduced me, I'm the Washington Council for the Anti-Defamation League. This has been my job for the past 30 years. So I am really familiar with the uh, potential and the limits of law and legislation. It's what I do. And I'm really sure that everyone on this call understands that we cannot outlaw anti-Semitism, racism, Islamophobia, hatred, homophobia. That is not something that can be done with law. It's one of the limits of law, but there are things that we can do that matter. And I am a firm believer in having the government use its bully pulpit. And there are many different ways to do that. Last week, there was a congressional resolution, unusual, bipartisan, unanimously approved congressional resolution on Charlottesville. Uh, approved in the Senate unanimously, then approved the very next day in the House um, by uh, uh, the entire House, and then sent to the president. He could have used it as an opportunity to bring a diverse group around as he signed this joint resolution. He did not. Um, but the resolution itself is condemning white supremacy, is condemning the violence of Charlottesville, honoring the victims of Charlottesville, and then a couple pretty good uh, points urging the president and his administration to use their bully pulpit to fight against hate crimes in a material way, to improve the reporting of hate crime, a useful congressional resolution, as useful as any resolution that does not have the power of law can be. Last week also, and you'll see one of the uh, slides will have some links, I think that, that Shira and the JFN folks will send them around to any participants that want them. Um, 80, more than 80 organizations sent a letter to the Department of Justice. It's a five page, single space, Ariel 10 font list of recommendations that 80 national organizations signed. Uh, the last time, in the last 30 years, the last time more than 80 organizations signed a five page Ariel 10 font listing of policies, regulations, programs, ideas, initiative, training programs. The last time that happened was, was never. There's never been a time that I can remember where a coalition has brought together uh, this kind of range of ideas. And part of it is the times. The times require uh, coalition work. The times require good, thoughtful ideas, specific concrete ideas that the Justice Department and that the federal government can do. So that's the federal level. At the state and local level, and I really like what Eric said about finding tasks for our constituents to do to be involved. I think part of it is being in the streets and being present in the streets sometimes. And part of it is working on state and local initiatives. 45 states in the District of Columbia have hate crime laws. Five states don't. Um, not every hate crime law includes all categories like disability or gender identity, sexual orientation. Hate crime laws are really important. We have been advocating writing them for a couple decades, but we also know that hate crime laws are blunt instruments. It's of course much better to prevent hate crimes in the first place. ADL, SPLC, other coalition allies do amazing work on anti-bias education. Um, really proud that um, many of the funders that are part of this call are people that care about the no place for hate work that we do, that kind of anti-bias work, don't hate your neighbor because they're 
black, because they're gay, because it's a woman, because it's a Japanese American, a new immigrant. Uh, those types of programs are really, really important and complement the uh, hate crime laws that exist. All 50 states have bullying prevention laws, but they don't outlaw bullying. They require policies to be developed on bullying prevention, notice, discipline, um, how uh, bullying is defined. Uh, but who knows whether an individual school district or an individual school is training their teachers on the bullying prevention law that already is on the books. That is something, as Eric says, that uh, individuals can do in their own school, for their own grandchild school. Things like that are just incredibly important. There are, in the aftermath of the election and in the aftermath of a dramatic increase that we and others had reported on hate crime, a number of state attorneys general who have elevated the work that they're doing to prevent hate violence in California, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Virginia. The governor or the attorney general has uh, set up a hate crime hotline, has elevated victim services, uh, victim advocacy resources, um, something to respond to elevated concerns and elevated reported hate crimes. Um, I think it's really important, and I guess I would make two final points on the programmatic front. One of them is the best way to fight hate crime is to fight hate. And you cannot fight hate crime. You cannot fight white supremacy. You cannot fight what we saw in Charlottesville in a vacuum. Uh, and that vacuum indicates so clearly now that you cannot address hate violence or white supremacy in the context of thinking of it as an island. We have seen significant funding cuts to civil rights office budgets at the federal and at the state level in some cases. We have seen at the federal level a Department of Justice that wants to reverse policies to reform our criminal justice system. We have seen support uh, by this Justice Department for in intentionally discriminatory voter ID laws, not the ADL that's saying that they're intentionally discriminatory, not the SPLC, but federal district judges that say that they're intentionally uh, discriminatory, and yet the Justice Department defending them. We have seen a, quote, election integrity task force set up, but it appears to us and others that they that this uh, commission is designed to promote voter suppression. We've seen a withdrawal of guidance on Title IX protections for transgender students, the effort to ban transgender individuals from serving in the armed forces. We have seen the Justice Department filing briefs promoting religion being used as a sword to thwart anti-discrimination laws, like the brief that was filed just last week in the Supreme Court case involving this Colorado baker who did not want to bake a cake for a same-sex couple violating Colorado anti-discrimination law um, along the way. So when you think about fighting hate crime and fighting white supremacy, you cannot just think of it in terms of individuals who are walking through Charlottesville uh, shouting uh, Nazi phrases and um, carrying tiki torches. There's a full range of responses that the Jewish community, that the social justice community should be involved in in a dramatic way. There is a phrase, a uh, longtime leadership conference on civil and human rights leader, Wade Henderson, which I'm sure that many people on this call know Wade. And Wade often says, if you want a friend, you have to be a friend. Jews cannot end anti-Semitism by ourselves. As Yavila said, we need to be seen as part of the fabric of justice. Coalitions are the way that we get things done. If you want to fight against anti-Semitism, it can't just be JFN. It can't just be Jewish organizations, the SPLC, allies and partners. It has to be a broad-based coalition approach. 
And I guess the last thing I want to say is that there is a classic ADL tactic. It is a civil rights movement tactic. Um, it is turning a negative into the positive. And I like what Eric said about lemons to lemonade. And that really is our challenge right now. This is a time when the nation's attention is focused on white supremacy, on hate violence, on hate crimes, and we really have an opportunity to try and figure out ways forward. That was the reason why it was worth the many, many hours that it took to get 85 organizations to sign on to this five-page, single-space, REL 10 font list of programs and initiatives. Everybody had their own ideas about what should be elevated. I am, you should take a look at the different organizations. From a Jewish community perspective, there are a number of Arab American organizations that signed on, a number of Muslim American organizations. We don't agree on a range of other things, maybe having to do with Israel-Palestine issues, but on this, we came together to talk about the need to have the federal government use their bully pulpit. And that really is where it, uh, I want to leave it, because the idea that civic leaders at every level should be speaking out is critically important. We call on the president to speak out. And we have another link on the list of links that I provided to something called the Mayor's Compact. Over 300 of the nation's 1,400 uh, mayors that belong to the U.S. Conference of Mayors have signed something called the Mayor's Compact. And again, it's not just hortatory language. It says everybody should love each other, kumbaya, but it's specific uh, commitments that these mayors are making to try and do something good. You should check and see whether your mayor is on, whether your mayor is doing anything, uh, to implement these commitments. If your mayor is not on, try to get her or him on um, and try to move this forward. This is something that every single community can uh, build out from, leverage, um, scale up. Um, and that's where I'm ready to turn it back to you, Sharon, for questions and answers. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank you to Michael and Yavila and to Eric. Um, such powerful um, uh, openings and lots of you know connections across uh, the concepts of intersectionality. Where I'm already seeing some of our participants have some questions, um, leaning into the opportunities of this moment and um, how we can respond. Uh, the need for showing up for social justice across and deepening that in our community and to getting proximate with each other and across our communities and across our movements um, were just a couple of the key themes that I heard from all three of you. Um, I would love to uh, pose a question to the three of you to just sit on for a few minutes and then I'm going to turn over to some of the questions that have been uh, queued up through Zoom. Um, if um, you're uh, not on Zoom, I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer questions via phone. Um, so if you are on Zoom and you do have questions, please uh, start to queue them up. If you don't feel comfortable asking the question or you don't have the audio, we can absolutely do that for you. Just uh, make a note in your question. So thank you. Um, so the, the question I'll tee up for, for after this first round is, to ask each of you to go back to this moment, um, the challenges and the opportunities uh, that you see and some suggestions for funders on this call. Um, what should funders be thinking about and what are, what are ways that we can be working more deeply to support um, deepening the fabric of this movement? So thank you. Um, we'll start with Lee. Lee, I see you on video, hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Lee Winkleman. I'm the California Organizing Director for the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. Uh, my question is this. So I, I love this idea of alternative creative actions, uh, making lemons from lemonade. Is the recommendation then that we do not organize or participate in counter demonstrations when the white nationalists come to town? Or is the recommendation we do both? Great question. Thank you, Lee. So this is, I think it's a really important question. 
what what I would say first is that it it is not an either or. There are certainly times where um, you will need to show a very visible response. It is it is I, I think it cannot be underestimated how critical you know large scale mobilizations are in in this moment. I, what I'm suggesting is that there has been an over-reliance on one form of mass mobilization, which has been primarily direct confrontation. Um, and what happened in, in this scenario is that it, it has become political theater. So what's happening is white nationalists are showing up. They are showing up to provoke a physical, um, uh, a physical confrontation, um, which only um, trains them in how to be better street fighters. So we should understand that their goal right now is to build a physically militant movement. And the way you build a physical militant movement is actually through street fighting. And so in many ways, we can be helping them create the training ground that allows them to be better um, intimidators. And so being creative and finding ways for people to mobilize visibly and courageously, I think is very critical. And that tends to be through creative ways. We should be clear, the majority of Americans are not going to turn out to an event where they believe there's going to be physical confrontation. It's just not going to happen. And so it's about finding other avenues for those other individuals to participate visibly. So I guess I would say one other thing, Lee, it's Michael, um, and that is that I think it's very unsatisfactory. Like, I think the classic technique of the Anti-Defamation League in the face of when hate groups come to town, there are um, white supremacists marching in the street. I think the classic advice that we have is don't uh, go to the space where they are and confront them directly. And I think that's an incredibly unsatisfactory response to the constituents. It's undoubtedly the right response for exactly what Eric just said. That's what they want. They want the attention. They want the media cameras. They want people, you know, just trying to get at each other, shouting in each other's face. That's what makes media attention. I'm sure for, for the white supremacist and the extremist, that's what constitutes a successful protest. And it's unsatisfactory to have the Anti-Defamation League or others tell people, don't do that. Don't give them what they want. But we do need to have very creative responses about what is the best way to go. And it, it might be a counter protest across town in an entirely different place, doing what Yavila talks about so persuasively, uh, bringing people together to fight hate, not in the same uh, location, not in the same space, but uh, trying to elevate uh, the good messages, the positive messages at a time when there's hate happening across town. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Uh, we have a question here from Josh Ratner. Sharon, I just wanted to answer. Oh, good, great, sure. Yavila, go ahead. I just wanted to say really quick to you, Lee Winkleman, that there's a way in which, I don't know who that is, but if they could mute, that would be great. Um, there's a way in which right now, I am thinking about the impetus of why it's easiest for us to go out and find a response to white supremacy and white nationalism as counter demonstrations when there are other things that we really need to be doing that history has told us have been more effective. I imagine that in the context of Nazi Germany and fascism, when the brown shirts were marching through the streets of Germany, that it was more helpful for people to be thinking about who their relationships were with, who they might need to offer a basement to, who they might need to give space to in the top level of their factory in order to save them from the direct 
impacts of white nationalism and white supremacy. And this has been on my mind lately. I live in a town where they put up these signs that says, we are your neighbors in three different languages. And there are bunches of signs all over my neighborhood that white folks in suburbs have been very willing to protest by putting on their lawns. And I'm walking around with the question as to whether those same folks would be able to hide folks who are now being directly targeted by DACA. Would they be willing to stand were a policeman to come up and try to take a neighbor of theirs off of the street, would they be willing to protest in the form of getting in between that policeman and that person who's being directly targeted? These are times when we have to hold our desire to protest, not just in a cognitive way, but in an affective and behavioral way, where we understand by speaking to the people who are most targeted and made most vulnerable by both the messages and the systemic implications of white supremacy and white nationalism. We have to be in conversation with that and ask what is most needed and be able to offer that be able to offer that in a very personal way. I think that's harder than calling your government official. I think that's harder than getting out there and protest. I think it's something that comes from a deeply emotional place in a person to feel directly affected, impacted, and ready to act. And those are the places where I wanna see our community doing our work to be ready to show up. And I don't know necessarily that going out to a protest puts you directly in that kind of conversation with yourself and others. So I would just to add that level that in addition, yes, to doing the systemic work of laws and policy and change making, that we agree to be proximate in a very direct way because that is what's gonna change our country. Our country has been in this for over a hundred years and there are reasons why we have not changed. There are reasons why we have not moved forward. There are reasons why what you saw in 1979, you're seeing in 2018. And it's not because we haven't worked on policy. It's because we haven't worked on our internal work and done our, our, the work we have to do internally to be in relationship and show up in different ways. And I just want to add that to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Yavila. I, I have to say amen. Um, I'm going to pass this on to Joshua for a question. Hi, I hope you can hear me OK. Um, my question is uh, really to all three of you, but anyone who wants to can chime in. And the question has to do with intersectionality. So as intersectionality continues to grow and Jewish inclusion in intersectionality campaigns is increasingly challenged due to Israel-Palestine issues, the Dyke March in Chicago being but the latest example of many, how can we best build the broad-based progressive coalitions to combat white nationalism? There seems to be more opportunities for coalition building on the center right than, the, than on the left right now with regard to that issue but we clearly need both sides if we truly want to combat white nationalism. I, well, I think all of us have an opinion. I think it's who wants to go first. Go ahead, Eric, I you, you can. Okay. Look, I, here's what, what I would say. One of the things that, again, I just want to reinforce, there is there is a difference. There is there is a fundamental difference between systems of white supremacy, right, that have functioned in our society, and and this emerging white nationalist social movement. We do ourselves a, a very uh, big disservice to our communities by treating them as the same phenomena. Um, one piece to keep in mind is one is a system and one is a social movement that is not yet in power. It has not ever been in power. And the day it is in power, none of us will have to guess that it's in power. Things will look very different in terms of how the society would function and operate. With that said, we have to understand that it is, it is a social movement. And I think an effective response to the social movement is a broad-based response, understanding that there are a number of different areas that need to be energized, whether we're talking about political and social movements, whether we're talking about faith-based constituencies, whether we're talking about artists and entertainers, Republicans and, and, and Democrats, there, there are spaces for everyone uh, to mobilize in this moment. And 
we should be focused on, on getting people to, to speak up and, and speak out. However, we should be clear, right? We, we should be very clear. If we are waiting um, for folks who are sitting on the sidelines um, to, to join us, we may find ourselves waiting uh, until the dragon comes and devours us. Um, and so, yes, coalition building is really important, putting pressure on folks to speak up, creating ways for folks to, to speak up. But there, there is no imaginary coalition. We have to understand that it is pretty likely, at least based off of polling over the last 10 years, that we have pretty much the coalition we're gonna get. And so what we need to do with our coalition is to build its capacity, right? To contest power. Um, but this is about a fight over who controls democratic institutions. Do we control democratic institutions to expand the work around inequality in the society? Or do we allow another group to seize these democratic institutions to both destroy them um, and provide a justification for the removal of people of color um, from the state. I, that, that would be my short, um, my short answer, is that I actually think it is likely we have the choir we're gonna have in this moment. Hmm. Thank you. So that's interesting. Um, Yavila, did you wanna to speak to that too? I mean, I, I would say this intersectionality piece, we, we don't have enough nuance available to us in the context of the way in which we're approaching these issues. I have seen the word intersectionality, which comes out of a very vibrant and broad way of understanding social justice movements, which allows us to hold all aspects of ourselves at once as we pursue justice being redefined especially in Jewish space, as something that's antithetical to our commitment to justice. And I think that comes from lack of proximity and relationship to the ways in which people who are directly targeted define those words and the way in which they relate to those words. And we need to have better education in terms of how that works. I would also say that Israel-Palestine being the only compelling entry point and conversation issue around Jewish relationship to justice has also kept us out of coalitions. We should have multiple entry points to justice and multiple ways in which we are able to be critical of ourselves and others as we look toward the North Star, which is equity and justice for all. We have allowed ourselves to become sidelined and pushed to the extreme as a one issue people, and we need to move away from that in order to get into deeper coalitions. We also have to address the places in which we have become silenced. We have allowed justice to be something that we allow other people to take the frontline narrative on. If there are places that we see justice as relevant to our people, we have to be speaking out, we have to be speaking up, we have to be standing up in ways that don't allow people to take the narrative away from us. When we look at things like Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump and Trump's visit to the Holocaust Museum and the equivocation close Charlottesville and white supremacy in general in our country, there is a Jewish voice that needs to be raised in regard to all of those things. And it should not be a reactionary voice. It should be a proactive voice so that when people see us, they see on us the, the feelers that allow them to reach for our hands and stand together in coalition. If our hands are either over our heads as victims or clutching ourselves in fear, that does not make someone who is trying to fight for justice want to reach for your hand. You look as if you're somebody who is not going to be a good ally, somebody who's not gonna stand in the name of justice with you when your life and your survival is at stake. We have to show up as fierce and powerful and wise and all the beautiful things we are as a people, but we have to show up that way and not wait for that narrative to be reactive. What are the ways in which on our own, if no one were ever around us, that we could speak to 5,000 years of fighting for justice, of fighting against our own oppression? What are the ways in which we could speak that so loudly that no one who stands for the North Star of Justice would not want us as partner? This is the way in which we have to be in coalition. Intersectionality is holding all of those things at once, not just the ways in which we are 
privilege. And we are privileged. We are more educated. We have more access to government. There are ways in which we live in suburbs. There are ways in which we are privileged. But we also have used that privilege historically in this country to make more change than any people that has lived here as a minority. Why aren't we telling that story? Why aren't we putting that out front so that we can stand for justice in a way that will make people our partners? There's internal work we have to do as well as external work we have to do. And I say hold the intersection, intersectionality of it all. Be personal about it, be interpersonal about it, be systemic institutional about it, and be cultural about it, and be Jews, damn it. Be Jews. Jews are powerful. Let's show up that way so that we can be in better relations. Yeah, I think that's fabulous and smart and good. Um, I think the JFN could have its own uh, webinar. Maybe it would even last more than two hours, like an overnight or something, on these whole questions of intersectionality and Israel-Palestine and how that complicates our work, which it no doubt does. I don't think it helps us to, I, I definitely think that we need to know more, be proximate as uh, Yavila says, but it won't help us not to call out anti-Semitism when we see it. And the Chicago Dyke March is an example uh, that you had um, mentioned, Josh, and there's no question that that is a case where it's appropriate to call it anti-Semitism and then to try and fix it. It's not enough just to throw darts and walk away. You need to be able to figure out like what is next and how uh, to address these issues in the future. But I think being in a position of saying, if you want a friend, you have to be a friend, works both ways. It's not just us that is trying to be proximate and um, see us as part of the fabric of justice, as Yavila says, but we have expectations for our coalition partners, and we also have red lines. And when those red lines are crossed, um, it's appropriate and it's important to be able to call them out. Thank you. Thank you for all the answers. I, I agree we could spend a lot more time on this topic, um, not 5,000 years, um, but definitely uh, more time together. And I would put a plug in here for both um, uh, the group of funders within the Jewish Funders Network that works on social justice issues, as well as the round table. These are both uh, affinity groups that we can plug into as funders to keep deepening our uh, connections to each other and to these conversations around intersectionality and what it takes to really, as Yuvila was saying, lean into the power we have and also um, own this moment in a way that recognizes a long history of understanding the intersection between these issues. So thank you all three of you for, for those responses. Um, I have another question queued up here um, from Jen, who uh, doesn't have the mic available to her. And um, hold on one second here. Uh, well, we have it here, Jen. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you speak to how white Jews working in Jewish community organizations and foundations can work to model holding the duality of being targets of anti-Semitism while holding power in the systems of racism and white supremacy? So another sort of extension of the conversation that we were just having. Thank you, Jen. Yavila, do you want to uh, we'll switch it up a little bit? Yeah, I'll start. Um, I'm, I'm currently working with the Jewish Women's Foundation on an initiative to be able to look at and take seriously the issues of racial justice that are relevant to them and their funding strategies. And our discussion began with the idea of getting proximate. And they, yes, they would like to be proximate to the communities of color that they service. They service communities in Africa and they service communities internationally, and they have been doing that. But they also wanted to start with the idea of getting proximate to the people of color that live in community with us and learning the stories across racial lines that keep us out of proximity to the issues of racial justice that most directly impact our community. So we started with doing work, gathering Jewish women of color in conversation and asking Jewish women of color, what do they need? What do they need to feel powerful 
in this moment in our country when under the rubric and variable of race, many people of color are feeling powerless. And so we gathered and we created a situation where women of color would talk to women of color and white women would listen. And that initial conversation started to inform the ways in which the trustees understood themselves, meaning there were women who identified as Mizrahi, who identified across the ethnic and cultural spectrum, who were white passing that were actually a part of the foundation that had never spoken up and said, this is what I think. This is where my cultural background actually has impact on the way in which we do our work. And something about opening up a conversation with women of color allowed them to have voice as women with power in a different way. And that was something that was a dividend. And then in addition to that, after that conversation began, we continued and we are continuing to have a series of breakfasts where the trustees are continually in conversation with people of color who are engaged in activism, many of them, who are from Ethiopian backgrounds, who are from Syria, and who are directly impacted by the changes in travel and DACA. There are many ways in which just within our community, the issues that are happening around the world actually have stories and nexus if we will see ourselves as a multicultural people and take those stories seriously. So they began within, they began inside. What they're going to continue to do is, yes, give money outwardly and connect to the social justice field. But I have a feeling that after a year of having these conversations as a multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural group, that their funding strategies will be impacted by that as they go to speak outward. That is just one example. For those who are not primarily dealing with Jewish folk, and who are already engaged in the social justice fabric, the thing I always say to people is let your work be guided by the voices of the people who are most targeted and made most vulnerable. If there is not a direct pipeline to hear information from those people as to what they need and to take seriously the impact of white privilege and cultural privilege upon how we actually go about doing our work, then what will happen is often we do something called dysfunctional rescuing. And that is that we go out there and try to help people without letting their voices determine for us what they need and how it should be enacted. So to take time to question, where are we empowering and where are we disempowering with our funding work? What stories do we need on the table in order to do our funding most effectively? Where in, in the country right now are people being out of proximity with us, meaning us as funders, eliminating our ability to be most effective. And when I say that, I mean, we learned a lot around Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And we learned a lot about funding people to go down and build schoolyards when people needed jobs. And we learned a lot about going out into communities and not asking those communities, how are you affected on personal, interpersonal, systemic, and institutional and cultural levels? And I would say the first step for any funding community right now, as we're looking at people suffering across the country, is to get proximate to those communities, get enough narrative so that you can understand in first person and in their language what it is they need and follow that as the North Star in terms of funding, and then to stay in relationship beyond that, to be sure that the resources that we're offering actually are gonna have impact and make a change that we wanna see. So start within, in our communities. Don't forget that we are a multicultural and multiracial community. Address race and racism with Jews of color, and then use that information to impact how we can go out and end racism in the world is what my suggestion would be. I think that's a really good one. I mean. I, I would only add to that that I think um, it's, it's really important to be able to hold nuances. So, you know, and I think in, in the nuances we have to hold is that there is an emerging movement that does in no way sees Jews as white and um, in, in their calculation. And I think in terms of anti-Semitism, it's important to understand the difference between permanent privilege and temporal privilege, privilege that is given um, in exchange um, for certain things. And um, at least how anti-Semitism has played out in, in America, um, the exchange has been the downplaying of, uh, of uh, I think, Jewish principles and values of, um, 
you know, really standing up for, for justice and, and, and equity. And in those moments where the Jewish community upholds those values publicly is when we tend to see the biggest um, anti-Semitic um, upticks. So for, for those who do consider themselves white Jews, I, I don't see the Jewish community that way. I, I, um, I, it is a people and um, it, is, it, is a diverse, it is a diverse uh, grouping of people. And some do have temporal privilege based off of uh, colorism um, amongst that people. But I, I, I would say this. I would say for those folks who do have that temporal privilege within the Jewish community, it is really critical um, that you model the type of society um, you demand externally. That is not unique to the Jewish community. All of us are struggling with that. I, I think it's also important too to move away from this idea of left or right anti-Semitism. There's no left wing or right-wing anti-Semitism or black anti-Semitism. There is anti-Semitism in America, and um, none of us are immune from it, um, and all of us will express it within movements and within institutions um, and through our own attitudes and behaviors. And it's important um, at a moment when we're dealing with a movement that is driven by anti-Semitism um, to really center um, anti-Semitism and, and, and to lift it up. So um, I think it's important to, to point it out amongst our, amongst our colleagues. Um, but I also think, three, we need to keep a balance, right? Um, if we find ourselves more visceral, right, in our reaction to the anti-Semitism in uh, Dyke Mark in March in Chicago, but don't find ourselves as visceral as when um, Jeff Sessions uh, praises a 1924 uh, anti-Semitic law as good for America, a law that directly led to the murder of, of Anne Frank. If we don't find ourselves as visceral about Sebastian Gorka and his ties to neo-Nazis and the fact that he sits um, within, um, within the White House, um, if we don't find ourselves as viscerally angry um, about Sean Spicer um, and his comments uh, uh, about the Holocaust, um, if we don't find ourselves as viscerally angry about Donald Trump retweeting from an anti-Semitic website, um, we have to really question what is going on. Um, and I think anti-Semitism is a problem no matter where it manifests from, but it is not merely a issue of attitude or behavior. It is the fuel that is allowing a social movement to build power um, and seize the state. And we need to confront that and we don't confront it without centering anti-Semitism around responding to white nationalism. Thank you. Thank you, Yavila and Eric. Michael, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, I'm mindful of the time. I guess I would just think about something. I'm, I'm really um, always so fortunate to be asked to speak to the extraordinary uh, Religious Action Center legislative assistants when they do their orientation every year. And I was thinking back to when I was thinking about this, uh, the responses that Yavila and Eric were giving, and just one of the most amazing things that I have seen in my career working for the Anti-Defamation League is just how extraordinarily involved the Jewish community is on social justice issues, and individual Jews are. Many of them are white. Some of them are not white Jews, um, but the involvement of the Jewish community in these issues, the presence of the Jewish community in these issues is absolutely extraordinary. And so I totally agree with Eric that we need to have a balance when we respond to a Chicago Dyke March and we need to be present to be able to respond to the whole list of things that I mentioned, which are actually part of the 
letter that uh, the AD organization signed. We wanted to make sure that people understood that you can't fight hate crime without fighting hate and discrimination and that it's all of a piece. And I think we have an opportunity as Jews and in the Jewish community to be present proximate on a range of issues and to forward ourselves and not be apologetic about the uh, involvement that we have on the basis of white privilege. We, we benefit from that, no doubt, but we're also in the fight and should recognize that we are in the fight. Thank you. Well, I got so lost in all of your answers that I think um, uh, maybe perhaps I didn't moderate as well to get some more questions in, but um, there will be a part two to this conversation and um, I'm sure several conversations um, amongst funders uh, in the months ahead and days ahead. So I'm going to turn it back to Samantha for closing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Yavila, Eric, Michael. Uh, extraordinary conversation and um, we are so grateful as well to Abby and the Roundtable for uh, your partnership and participation. So as Sharon just mentioned, this is part one of a series. We're gonna continue this conversation uh, next month. Um, uh, specifically, you know, what do we need to do as funders and how can we act fast? And that program is gonna take place on October 30th. And we've got a full slate of JFN members um, participating and uh, Eliza Mazur is going to be uh, our moderator. So stay tuned for that and sign up. Um, I want to wish everyone again, thank you for, for joining us and a sweet and healthy Shana Tova to you all if you're celebrating. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much.